Morning, church. How is everybody this morning? Good. All right. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Let's come before the Lord. Let's humbly worship Him. Let's respond to His presence. It's so good to be with you guys and just worshiping. Lord, we are grateful always to be in your midst. We are grateful to be able to come together, Lord, and sing praises to your name. We are grateful that we have the freedom to do so, Lord. We know this is not true of everyone who lives on this humble earth, Lord, but we do have that privilege, um, and it's amazing, and we don't take it for granted, Lord. So we, this morning, we focus upon you. Our desire is to bring you glory, Lord. We join in with our family around us. We join in with the rest of the church that is doing so this morning. We join in with the elders and the angels in heaven, Lord, who are eternally singing your praises, Lord. We join in this eternal song, and we give you glory, God. So lead us, direct our hearts, clear our minds, so that we can connect with you, Lord, that we would draw near to you, Lord, as you are present here with us, God. We love you in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know how glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful one, and I love beautiful one. I adore beautiful one, and my soul must Powerful, so powerful, your glory fills the skies. Your mighty works displayed for all to see. beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing. How marvelous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one, and I love beautiful one. I adore beautiful one. in my heart with this love there's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you and you open my eyes to your wonders and you you caption my heart with this love there's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you beautiful one one I adore, beautiful one, my soul must see, oh, beautiful one, and I love, beautiful one, I adore, beautiful one, my soul must see, oh, my soul, my soul must see. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. 
beautiful world. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. Beautiful.
Come thou fount of all blessing. Yes, Lord. Isn't prone to wander. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Take and seal it, seal it for thy thoughts above. I want to read a passage from Isaiah 53. This is one of the famous messianic passages of Isaiah. Uh, it says in, in verse 10, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was put, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide with him a portion with the many. And he, wish, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray. Lord, Jesus, uh, uh, hmm. what amazing your grace is, Jesus, that you bore the sins of many. God, you bore the sins of each of us here this morning that confess your name. Lord, you're, you went to grief. Your soul cried out in anguish, and yet you were satisfying. See, seeing the fruit, seeing us come to faith in you, us being made righteous by you taking on our death, seeing the fruit of us coming to life in you and sharing infinite blessing with us, dividing the spoils with us, Lord, that we might live forever and all of eternity because of your amazing and great sacrifice. Lord, we celebrate that this morning. We praise you for your great love that the Father would ask you, the Father would send you to die on our behalf, and out of your love for the Father, you would obey him, and out of your passion for us, you would give yourself up. For the joy set before you, you endured the cross, Lord. And that joy is our sweet redemption, Lord. We praise you for that. In your son's name, amen. So what can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering, Lord? What can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering, Lord? Lord, what can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering, Lord? For all you've done, Lord. What can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering, Lord? What can I give? What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering? To the one who gave it all, who made it all. What can I give? 
What can I bring? What can I sing as an offering, Lord? is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Christ of In the sea, there's love. 
Yes, you are kind. Yes, you are kind. Glory to you, Lord. You are the cornerstone. You are the one we build our lives upon, Lord. Trust in you, we praise you, God. church. a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so sing that again Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. Yes, he loves us. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns 
finally inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets When I think about the way that he loves us oh, love us father and it's not it's not just a idea it's not just a thought it's not just a feeling but it's in fact a reality a gritty reality that you walked out 2,000 years ago and you continue to walk out every morning when we wake up all through the night as we sleep you are expressing your love to us. Indeed, the very cosmos is held together by your active will and force moment by moment. You create space and time for us that we might exist and know you and walk in the light of your grace and truth and love. We just praise you for that this morning in your son's name, amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Renaissance. How are we all doing? Good? Is it not awesome to worship the Lord? So a number of things going on I want to remind you all of and make you aware of. Um, we have a prayer walk coming up this July 8th. Uh, we will gather in a park and pray, and then we'll go do a walk around an abortion clinic and pray for those um, who are lost. And, and those who are in the womb and pray for life. You know, my popular media talks a lot about the culture wars, right? And praise God if we live in a land that has right laws, righteous repub democratic republic, you know, and, that, and as we participate in our democratic republic, praise God that we have godly leaders and godly laws. But I just want to say that's not the primary objective of our war in Christ. Our primary objective is the souls of the lost. That's what Jesus is fighting for. That's what we fight for. So as we go out to minister to young women who are in a desperate place in their life, thinking about desperate solutions, our mission and our goal is to minister the love of Christ to them, that they might be redeemed and find life in Christ. And for those who are walking in disobedience, those who are committing sins against the Lord, that we would be the voice of truth and of love, and that our presence would be a conviction to a lost and failing world, that men and women would repent and come to the, come to the Lord. Amen? Sorry, a little sermon, Jared preemptive little sermon just couldn't hold, couldn't hold myself back so opportunity to express all that on uh, July 8th uh, we'll, we'll really go there in with the in the spirit in the spiritual battle with salvation faith truth right righteousness of Christ that's what we go with amen 
So I hope you all can participate in that. Also, we have a table right outside last Sunday to donate to a ministry that helps women with unexpected pregnancies and helps them with counsel and provision and provides a safe place for them as they are uh, delivering their beautiful children. So uh, if you have something to offer there, that's great. And then we have a barbecue July 9th. Who likes barbecues? All right, more this Sunday. Last Sunday we had four people who liked barbecues. Now we have a majority, so you're like, you're, you're on it. So look forward to that. Renaissance does great barbecues. We always enjoy our food. So I encourage you to participate with us. And with that, why don't you stand and greet somebody? Well, good morning. Good morning to all of you. Happy to be worshiping you, uh, uh, worshiping with you this morning. I uh, don't want to misspeak on that account. Um, but I, I would also want to say that today's a very special service as we'll be taking and celebrating the Lord's uh, communion, or the Lord's Supper together, or what we call communion. And um, for that reason, we are actually going to take another break from our, our study and our series in the uh, pastoral epistles from uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, etc. Um, and we're going to dive into the book of Psalms today, um, looking specifically at Psalm 130. So if you would accompany me to that uh, portion of scripture, that's where we're going to be today. We're going to really spend our time and really camp out in two verses and uh, the title of uh, my message this morning is The Gift of Forgiveness. The Gift of Forgiveness. And we'll, we'll look at that. We'll, we'll make a um, beeline eventually to the topic of communion, but it's important for us to think through this deeply. So um, as uh, before we get into the scripture, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer together. Father, we approach you recognizing that every good gift we have in this life comes from above, comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow of turning. And Lord, we understand that the greatest gift that you give us is the grace, the mercy of forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, that he himself is our salvation, he himself is our way, our truth, our life, and that, Lord, by virtue of knowing him, we can have security in eternity. And I ask, Lord, as we remember this occasion, remember his death through the Lord's Supper, that, Lord, you would be among us and minister to our hearts, that, Lord, you would come near to us, would convict us of sin, would draw us closer to you. And Lord, help us to understand what it is to know your forgiveness and to fear you for it. So we ask that you would be with us, you would minister to us, and that your Son would be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, as I mentioned, that the title of our message today is The Gift of Forgiveness, and we are in Psalm 130. And uh, really, before we, we dive into the text, I want to start off with a quick question. What does, or where, what causes the fear of God in your life? There, there's a, there's a, a, of course, a turn of phrase in, that we see often in Scripture that is, that is the fear of God. And we see that, that men and women of God throughout Scripture are commended for their fear of God. But we have to ask, is this, what kind of thing is the fear of God? Is it a guttural fear of punishment that comes from maybe a near-death experience? or comes from a, a disciplinarian or something like that. You might think of like a parent looking at a wayward teenager and going, I'm going to put the fear of God in them, you know, in, in some sort of discipline. Is that, is that exactly what it is? Well, let's understand, first of all, you know, what the, what the fear of God is, because we're going to deal with the subject really as, we, uh, as the psalmist kind of writes about the fear of God. And one other definition of, of, of the fear of God, which I think is helpful for our purposes, is, is a trembling adoration. Not a casual relationship that we have with God, but a great trembling awe and love of His nature, of His character. And what is the pathway to gain the fear of God in our lives? We might think it's, of course, the, the near-death experience. Maybe, maybe a, a car crash that we're involved in. Or maybe a health scare that puts you know, that certain fear of us. And many of those things can, can bring us there. But the psalmist leads us through a different path. And that is of deep conviction of sin and the deep sense of forgiveness. And as the psalmist kind of tells us in, in Psalm 130, This kind of forgiveness is not cheap. It's not a casual, oh, I'm forgiven and now I'm I'm, uh, just fine to go about my life as usual. We see that forgiveness, understanding and experiencing the forgiveness of God is a means to understand fully what it uh, means to fear God. And so, Understand that the fear of God is not also uh, a, a simply a guttural fear, a way to keep God at arm's length, but a way in which to experience Him intimately and closely, knowing what He's done for us. So I've teased the verses enough, and so why don't we go ahead and, and read them in Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 130, verse 3 says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. This is a psalm that begins with a plea. We see in verse 1, this is out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy, it says in in verse 2. He starts out with a cry to God, but then the psalmist kind of shifts it and gives us not exactly subjective feelings, but it gives us a meditation and a couple doctrines about the nature and character of God. Really, the, the core at this, of this psalmist's plea is, yes, they, 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 are, they feel like they're in the depths. They, they, have, they feel as though they're in despair for whatever reason and whatever occasion. And then they turn with this, vo- uh, with this kind of concept of approaching God. And approaching God with the sense of iniquity. And we have these, these kind of turns of phrase that aren't really in common use, that, that we don't necessarily use quite often in our, in our usual conversations. He, and he says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? And he notes kind of a, a precarious state of mind and a precarious state of life, and 
really simply stated, what this means is, you know, if the Lord should count sins or, or reckon or understand or keep account of all of our sins, who could really stand before Him in any acceptable way? The, the phrase right here, who could stand, indicates that there is some sort of judgment eventually with which we stand before God. And so really the, the phrase right here is, is if, if God really did pay attention to our sins and really did hold us account to, for our sins, no one could withstand that kind of judgment because our sins are great and the holiness of God is such that He cannot stand these sorts of sins and iniquities in our life. And really embedded and assumed in this portion of Scripture is the teaching of, of the judgment of God, or more specifically what we would call the wrath of God. That really we are sinners, we are fallen, we are broken. And there is a day coming of judgment that is in this short span of life, really imminent on us. And the teaching of Scripture is very strong concerning God's wrath and very clear about God's wrath when He does come for judgment. But when we bring up the teaching and the understanding of what God's wrath is, it's, it's a teaching that is often misunderstood because we don't have much by way of an analog to understand what the wrath of God is really is. We maybe understand it as, you know, someone in our life who has problems with anger and we relate it to that. Maybe, you know, it's an angry father or something like that in our life. Or, and, and so we project that, that sort of thing on God and think, oh, God is just, you know, the wrath of God is really just his irrational anger and he's waiting for me to slip up so he can send, out, send down a lightning bolt from heaven and, you know, smite me completely. That might be, um, you know, Zeus or something, but that is not God. So, more recently, I think to rehabilitate that understanding of, oh, it's a vengeful, wrathful, angry God, we've leaned more on the doctrine of sin to, to think about God as, you know, you know, God is hurt by your sin, or, you know, you, you made God sad, you know, you, you hurt His heart. And in that way, you know, God is more like a disappointed parent or something like that. Well, I think neither of these are right understandings about the judgment of God, about the wrath of God. Really, Scripture gives us very specific descriptions about the wrath of God. And yes, they are, they are powerful and they are uh, uh, clear in their understanding and clear, I think, on one particular point, and that is their, the righteousness of God. That, that God's wrath is an extension of His core holiness and righteousness. It is an act that preserves both things. In Psalm 76, more noted on, on what it is, what the wrath of God, the intensity of the wrath of God, Psalm 76, verse 7 says, But you, you are to be feared, who can stand before you when once your anger is aroused? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 tells us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But all of this is not because God has mood swings or God has bad days. But all of the teaching of God's wrath and judgment comes from a place that God is perfect and holy and cannot stand to countenance sin. He cannot look at impurity. And that's why in Revelation chapter 16, verses 5-6, through 6, there's, there's a passage about God's punishing judgment on the earth. And God's pouring out, as if you will, bowls of wrath on the earth. And there's an angel over there giving commentary. And the angel says this, Just are you? O Holy One, who was, who is, and who was, for you brought these judgments. There's a sense in which 
we don't really know that much. Uh, 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 we have really an analog for that in our life, and I think it's mostly because we see in Scripture elsewhere in the, in the book of James that you know, the, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Only the wrath of God is an extension of the righteousness of God. And really, the the way, therefore, to orient ourselves properly to understand the wrath of God is to understand more deeply the depths of our sin and the state of our sin. Because we might look at various uh, instances of judgment, you might think throughout the prophets and God's dealing with the nation of Israel, where there were instances of great and grave judgment. And we might think that's, that's so intense but we won't won't fully understand it until we understand the depths of our sin. The psalmist, in this case, kind of turns to himself, if you will, and turns more broadly to all of us in a general human state to say, if you should one day call us all to account to mark those sins, no one could stand before you. And in the psalmist, therefore, does not turn to defense, against, uh, defense of himself, but really takes the stand against himself, understanding that I am the trespasser. I, I am the iniquitous one. I am the bad guy. The judgment of God pro- pro- properly orients our sense of moral good and right to, real, to make us fully understand our state that we are wrong and God is right. And so, really, the state of God's marking of iniquity, it seems as though the psalmist writes it off as kind of a a hypothetical, if God should mark iniquities. But we do have various promises in Scripture that, that eventually God will mark iniquities. Eventually, God does responsibly have to do something with sin And the fact that God has not yet called us to account for our sins does not really offer any meaningful comfort and really should not offer us any comfort. It's as though we took out a a bank loan and then spent ourselves into poverty. And just because the bank has not yet called that loan doesn't mean that we are not bankrupt. In that same way, just because judgment has not yet come does not mean we are not spiritually bankrupt. And that's why the psalmist really says, if you should, on the day of judgment, which you know maybe could come any day, if a person should die and stand before God, really no one has any grounds or standing. Should there be a reckoning for our sin today, there's no excuse, we have no defense, we have no grounds, we have no legal standing before God. And that's really the, the, what comes out of the psalmist's thoughts as he is in the, the depths of despair, that God, as I look at my own heart, as I look at the depths of my own sin, I see nothing to ingratiate me toward God. This is not a condition necessarily that that is felt by everyone, even though it's the reality of our human condition. But we must feel the condition in order for us to make the great discovery that the psalmist makes. And really the turning point of this psalm, of Psalm 130, comes in the next verse. Understanding the great sins with which we have fallen short before God, our our unrighteousness before God, the things we do wrong, the ways in which we break His commandments, the weight of that reality, it all starts to turn in verse 4 when the psalmist says, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Not many again make this make the trek to this reality. Many are 
too busy and maybe they're in their denial of their own state before God, or maybe they're presumptuous about their state of forgiveness that, hey, I'm a pretty good person. They haven't yet reached the point where they understand the full holiness of God and their own sin. Or maybe some others have been stuck for years on the perception that God is merely angry and wants to keep them away. But the psalmist here is on a positive and upward spiritual journey, ascending to the reality that yes, ascending to the understanding that yes, with God, there is forgiveness. With God, there is recourse. With God, there is some sort of way as we will learn to stand before Him even though our sins should keep us away and at great length and at great distance from God. It reminds us that our dealings with God are not just transactional, not that you know, we, we get some things from God and then you know, we, uh, we, we give some things to God, but they are personal. That the psalmist says, with God, this is what you can experience. With God, when you know Him truly and you draw close to Him, you find this great spiritual reality that there is forgiveness. The same God, yes, who is the judge, who is the righteous judge, who is the vengeful God, the wrathful God, is also a God of forgiveness. And really, this is the meat of the psalm. These two great doctrines, which ordinarily we might treat in tension, are really the, the full reality of what it means to know God. God is not an unrelenting or impersonal wall of wrath, though He has you know, justification, of course, to, to judge sin. But really, in all of this, we see that God is a forgiving God. God is a God who forgives. And I want to really understand two things about the fact that with God there is forgiveness. And that is number one, God's readiness to forgive. And number two, God's grounds to forgive. First of all, let's think about God's readiness to forgive. God is ready to forgive. It's a part of His character. If you will, this is a distinguishing trait that God includes uh, in His own bio, if you will. He talks about Himself this way in Exodus 34, verses 6-7. through seven. He identifies Himself, and actually He says, the Lord, the Lord. He talks about Himself, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin. This is the distinguishing trait of God. And I will say it's a distinguishing trait that you find uniquely with God. Uniquely with God among maybe all other false gods and all other you know, purported deities that don't exist. But it's also a distinguishing trait in the 21st century that we do not find in this world. Readiness and abundance of forgiveness. We might think of social situations, we might think of the, the sphere of public opinion, of fame, of politics, of maybe friend groups. The rule, not the exception, is that you will find bitterness, you'll find resentment, you'll find jealousy, you'll find passive aggressiveness, I guess, you'll find indifference and apathy before you will find forgiveness in this world. The world of public opinion, the world of social media has hard edges, it's unforgiving, and it's unrelentless. And yet, it is, a, it is a character trait that is close to the heart of God, that God is always and abundantly ready to forgive. 
But the same passage that I just quoted in Exodus 34 also places God's forgiveness and His readiness to forgive side by side with also His readiness to punish the guilty. The remainder of that passage in verse 7 says this, God will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Even more direct of a passage to point to, we might look at Psalm 99, verse 8. The psalmist writes, O Lord our God, You answered them, meaning You answered the prayers of Your people. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. And this is really important to understand why these are constantly displayed side by side when we get pictures and visions of God's character. It's important to understand that it's not cognitive dissonance in God's character or a defect in His character to simultaneously be angry and vengeful toward wrongdoing, and on the other hand, being loving and merciful. Rather, we should understand that quite often, God's righteous wrath and God's forgiveness are both a way for God to greatly display His power, His righteousness, and His holiness. And quite often, God's judgments are a means for redemption and a means for forgiveness. And the way in which we understand God's readiness to forgive is by God's grounds to forgive. God does not only is not only ready to forgive of his own character and willing but he also has good grounds he has authority to forgive as well god is a powerful god of course he made the heavens and the earth he made all things he made us so we can do anything right So we should think really, we should recognize that God does not forgive out of, in the way we might forgive, because maybe we're just too tired to hold on to the grudge. We might forgive out of a lack of strength in the same way we might step out of a fight because we're too weak to fight, or in an inability to provide retribution. God does not forgive like that. God forgives out of the abundance of His authority and His power to forgive. And He does not forgive in any cheap or light way. Rather, God provides, we are told in Scripture and shown in Scripture, the grounds, means, and totality of our forgiveness. I think quite often we don't understand what forgiveness is, maybe over and above a quick word. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgive you. And of course, you know, that's what we teach our kids. You know, we just say, say I'm sorry, you know, say I forgive you, and then then you make up. But in reality, God forgives because He provides means for and grounds for forgiveness. If God is maintaining His deep character that is a vengeful God that hates sin, that hates injustice, and needs to make all things right, it would then be, right, irresponsible for him to say, all these wrong things, hey, forget about it, water under the bridge. Because God, of his character and of his judgment, needs to make things right. And often, and really the reality of of the Christian, the great Christian truth is that God makes things right by making his people right. He makes people fit for forgiveness by the means He creates. And these means and these grounds and the authority with which God forgives is not cheap, but is hard won. And it's through the death of Christ Himself. This is the core of the Gospel, the core of what Christianity has to offer the world, the core of our message and the core of our worship. And that's really, it's, it's a communion passage, but it's important for us to, to understand this in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verses 20, uh, 
6 through 28. Jesus, this is what Jesus is talking about when he's instituting what we call the Lord's Supper with his disciples on, on the night before he was betrayed by Judas. And it says this in Matthew 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. There's a quote in your bulletin from the, the theologian John Owen, um, and I had to truncate it a little bit to fit it in there, but more fully he says this, men who have slight thoughts of God, whose hearts are never awed with his dread or greatness, who never seriously considered his purity and holiness, may think it no great matter that God should pardon sin, but do they consider the way whereby it is to be brought about, even by the sending of His only Son, and that to die? And forgiveness for us in Christ is the fullness and the, the great blessing of what the Bible calls justification, that we are made just and righteous before God. It's not something that happens that we can just will ourselves into the good nature of God. It's nothing where we can just say, hey, I would love to be righteous. And God says, here you go. It's the blood of Christ. It's at great cost that was poured for us, which gives the relationship that we have with God its grounds and its authority and its meaning. In Romans chapter 5, um, if I'll turn there quickly, Romans chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, we read this. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from what? From the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. When we experience the forgiveness of God, which is at the core of the Gospel, it's not that God has forgotten His wrath, but it's that God has diverted His wrath onto His Son. Therefore, Christ is our grounds for all our forgiveness. And therefore, God can justly approach us, and we can approach God for His mercy. God can approach us with goodness and forgiveness, because now that forgiveness has authority. It has teeth, if you will. On that grounds, we see in Psalm, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we forgive our sins, God is faithful in what? Well, he's faithful and just. He's right. He's right to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what makes forgiveness? the ability for, to consider someone who is forensically guilty of iniquity and sin, of maybe the worst sins imaginable, what makes that kind of forgiveness possible? Well, the work of Christ, which redeems us. But let's talk about the end of forgiveness, which I teased at the kind of beginning of this message. What is the intended goal to change us and to bring us about to when God grants us forgiveness? There is forgiveness with you, the psalmist writes, that you may be feared. The proper response to the forgiveness of God is fear. Or as I noted, that, that trembling adoration. The realization that yes, you were just snatched from the pit by the fact that God forgave you. That God has cleansed your sins. That you can pray and approach God and say, forgive me, and you ha suddenly have grounds before for which there were no grounds for the great reality that we can be forgiven through the blood of Christ. And therefore, we come to and celebrate 
on a weekly basis, first of all, and worship together. We celebrate and worship and sing songs to God because of this great forgiveness. But we also celebrate in particular as a means of, of, of fearing God, as a way to, to fear God together, as a means to come before Him in trembling adoration. We celebrate the Lord's Supper as well as a means to love and revere God. What is the Lord's Supper? What it is? What, what is it when we celebrate communion? Well, it's a celebration for Christians who in obedience to the Lord's command, as he told his disciples to do and as we continue to celebrate, it's a time in which we reflect upon his blessings and share fellowship with his grace and mercies together. And we share fellowship understanding that forgiveness was bought for us by his very body which was the authority and the grounds of forgiveness. If I can add in another quote from another theologian, uh, Jonathan Edwards said, Our souls partaking of these spiritual benefits, meaning the forgiveness of sins, is represented by partaking of the body and blood of Christ because those benefits are well compared to food. They are the food and nourishment and life of our souls, which we could not obtain in any other way than by Christ's being slain. So I want to close with three points of, and as we consider communion and transition into that time. But number one, we should remember that communion is a time to remember. Remember who you are in your natural state. Remember that you have no authority, just like any, no one else has any authority, to approach God on your own merits. That if God should suddenly call to us to account for our sins, we could not stand before Him. But also remember what it took to make you right. And that's why Christians should always have in the back of their minds, on a daily basis, the intentional meditation of the death of Christ. That we wake up in the morning and we have assurance that we are redeemed not because of anything good we've done, not because of a subjective or emotional experience, but because of the reality of what Christ did on the cross for us and shedding His blood. So communion is a time to remember. But also communion is a time to repent. I think maybe we can we risk sometimes misunderstanding communion that, oh, this is a time of celebration, maybe self-congratulation that we appreciate ourselves for being a part of a church. But no, it's not a place for self-congratulation. It's also not a place for false presumption that, oh, this is a means by, as though the elements themselves make us forgiven. Rather, it's a place to think deeply about our sin and to say, Lord, if there's anything I'm doing, if there's any path I'm on now, Lord, I recognize how much of an extent you took to redeem me from that path. And therefore, I should not live in those sins any longer. So communion is a time to repent. But also, and lastly, communion is a time to rejoice. Maybe, you, maybe I'm the only one who thinks this, but I often think, you know, should I be happy during communion? Should I be sad during communion? Because after all, we are celebrating the death of our Lord. So are we supposed to be happy? Are we supposed to rejoice? Are we supposed to be sad or solemn? Well, the answer, honestly, is, is yes. Communion is an act of spiritual worship, and it often meets us wherever we are in our lives. And God might use communion and might use the real tangibility of of partaking in, in these elements of, of, of these wafers and, and the, the grape juice to make us really fully understand the cost at which our forgiveness came. And if we understand it rightly, it will make us joyful. If we realize that we've applied the blood to our own sins, if we realize that we have great merit to now approach God and to know Him and be secure in our assurance that we are going to heaven, we recognize the great joy in the presence of God. And so at this time, really, the, uh, 
uh, Aaron and Izzy will, will come up and sing a song and just some brief instructions. We do have the elements back there. And we'll ask you during this song to, to stand up when you're ready and to take them and to sit back down. And um, uh, after everyone is, is seated once again, Pastor John will come up and lead us in prayer and we will partake in communion together. Um, but otherwise, we will go ahead and, and close at this time in prayer. Just thank God for the reality of what we celebrate this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for this psalm. It really is a psalm for all seasons. That Lord, no matter how good we feel or how much despair we feel, here is the reality. We are sunken too deep in our sins to save ourselves. And yet, Lord, you offer us the means and the grounds of forgiveness and you offer it through nothing less than the death of your Son. I ask, Lord, that we would take it all in this morning, that, Lord, we would draw near to you, knowing that you are a forgiving God, and maybe for some of us, for the first time in our lives, that we would approach you for the first time, understanding the forgiveness of the sins that they have through Christ to approach you for the first time and realize that they are sinners in need of a Savior and that they can call upon the Lord to be saved and believe on Christ for their salvation. So we ask that you would bless this time as we celebrate you. In Jesus' name we pray. yourself a disciple of Christ, if you've put your hope and faith and trust in him uh, at some point in your life and you're walking with him, uh, I encourage you to take this little, little 
emblem here, and if you, it's a little bit of a trick, but if you peel off the very clear top piece, you'll see the uh, little piece of wafer, a little bread. Go ahead and take that. Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover. The Passover is when God spared the Hebrews and protected them. And they had put the blood of, of a lamb on their doorpost. And it's in that context that Jesus said, Jesus took the bread and, and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat. Likewise, he took the cup and he said, this is, the, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. Sing in response to him, that chorus. celebrate you Lord the sacrifice you've made and it has given us redemption Lord that you paid a price that we just could not pay and through that Lord we we have forgiveness it's nothing that we've earned it was given to us Lord we praise you God Our sins away, oh God. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us through the cross. Our hearts are changed because of your great love. You You're alive. You rule, you reign, you 
said you're coming back again I know you will and all the earth will sing your praises all the earth will sing your praises No one, no name can rise above you, Lord. One hope, one life will shine forevermore. Your kingdom in heaven and on earth. Your children stand to sing of your great word. You live, you die, you said in three days you would rise, you did, sure alive. You rule, you reign, you said you're coming back again, I know you will, and all the earth will see. Praises, all the earth will sing your praises. See one last time. You live, you tied, you said in three days you would rise. You did, you're alive. much for your great love for us, Lord. Help us to walk and go out in joy of your forgiveness. In your son's name, amen.